thing. So the idea is that you know you can you know you can fledge, you can grow up, leave the nest, leave mom and dad, and try to raise a family, or better still, get some mentoring and coaching, and you know get a bit of practice by helping mom and dad raise the next generation or the next uh, the next batch of children. Then you've got a bit of experience because you've handled the Maldives and the Nangis kind of thing. And then you can grant breed on your own. Um, so it's interesting how mammals and birds have independently discovered the same technique. Another social breeder is yellow billed babbler. And I can't remember the exact name of the person who did this, so I'm not going to mention it because I get it wrong. But I remember reading, I believe in the Salon Bird Club notes, somebody uh, used a water pistol and uh, sprayed some colored dyes onto a flock of babblers and watched them at the nest. And he found that the babblers uh, do social breeding as well. So it's not just the father and the mother who come and incubate, the, you know, the brothers and sisters also come and incubate. It's a, it's a social effort, it's a communal effort, a bit like what humans do. And there are other interesting things uh, with birds, which ties up with evolution, so sexual dimorphism is one thing. So we know that the males sort of tend to be the poses and you know, str strutting around and showing off your stuff. So you might think that you know, it's the males who are sort of uh, having the upper hand and, and playing a dominant role. But if you read into Darwinian selection, you find this is actually its female choice. It's really the females are calling the shots, and it's the males who are being made to go through the hoops and evolve fancier, longer plumage or something like that to impress the males. Um, now, every animal doesn't have that. Obviously, human beings do, because males, as you know, are very beautiful. <laughs> uh, and some birds seem to do that as well. Uh, so um, again, with birds, the, the endemics quite often you find it's the endemic uh, male that is more brightly colored. A uh, quick thank you to some of the other photographers who helped me with that images as well. Um, so 34 endemics, about a third or more, show one degree or the other of this dimorphism. Uh, and scientists think that this is really this whole thing about uh, you know, female selection. The females want him to select the best male, and a sign of fitness is how bright and vivid the male is, or how long it stays up, or whatever. And there are other mysteries that we don't know the answer to. So here's a close up of the blue magpie, and look at its uh, amazing eye ring. Uh, now, behavioral ecologists like to think that there's a purpose behind everything. Uh, now is that a purpose or is this just something that just happened before the way it did? Uh, we don't know. I mean, our blue magpies attracted to other blue magpies with big eye rings. Uh, you know, if it's more frilly, is that more attractive to a female blue magpie? We don't know, but there are interesting questions if you go in search of them. Then the endemic birds, like other birds, are uh, very much part of this very complex web of life. Uh, so they are vectors. Um, so here's our thick tree. Um, a lot of plants, tropical plants, have uh, evolved to be dispersed over distances by birds and bats. So uh, Atika is sort of a, it's a good example of uh, what's called cauliflory, where the, the fruit grows on the bark, which makes it easy for things like bats to land. Uh, so they sort of they package it very easily uh, for pick up and transport, like the way Amazon from their, their houses. Um, and here's a small, small barber. Um, coming in, doing it, so it's like Amazon might be using drones to deliver things, uh, the plants are being having a winged uh, delivery of their offspring to further parts 
for a long time, thanks to core evolution. Here's a bit of scattered stuff, uh, molecular phylogenetics. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail because I, I don't understand a lot of the scientific detail myself, but I'll just give you a flavor. So for a long time, uh, you know, biologists have classified things by looking at the external appearances. So we can easily see that they're related to monkeys because, you know, we have so many attributes in common. Uh, in the last 20, 30 years, scientists have been using uh, studies of DNA to try and work out the evolutionary relationships. So when they did it with plants, some very interesting results came out. And this is an extract of what of the work they've done with plants. So you find that the flowering plants do something called the Australia's split out. And then the water lilies, which we're all very familiar with, and you know, it's a big feature in temples, split out, which means all the other 450 families of plants are related to the water lilies. They're, they're a sister, and the water lilies are a very, very ancient plant family. So when the results came out, they were so surprised they did the tests again using fresh DNA and then they sampled it at different loci. Uh, and the result was that something nobody had expected that the water lilies, which you take for granted, are one of the most ancient families of flowering plants. Now, similarly, you can use the DNA to work out other evolutional relationships. Uh, and there's a fantastic team at the University of Colombo, at the Avian Ecology Node, led by Dr. Sampat Senratna, who you see up there, um, uh, carrying a, a scimitar Bible. Uh, so his team have been doing uh, a molecular phylogenetics and trying to understand uh, some of these relationships. And an interesting result that's come out is that the oriental white eye you see on the top is not a sister species of the Ceylon white eye. Okay. Now, to explain this, uh, these are extracts from these papers, and again, all the citations are given for people who want to download this PDF and uh, read up on these things. And I would encourage you to read up, even if you don't understand the technical bits, you know, uh, there's enough stuff there written in plain English, which is interesting. So if you look at the top diagram, uh, now you would think that what's happened in Sri Lanka is like what's happened in Africa, where, say, white eyes go to a mountain range in a period of time. Some white eyes go up the mountain, and they become isolated from the white eyes in the lowlands, and they become a new species, and they might become endemic just to this mountain. The same thing happened in this mountain range. Another, uh, finding the same lowland white eye, you can have another mountain white eye evolving up this mountain. So, common origin, but different mountains can have different white eyes. So, with our white eyes, so you might think if you look at, uh, this is difficult for the people uh, at the front, uh, can I point? Okay. So you think that what happened was that a white eye came, and let's say there's the oriental white eye, which you find in the dry lowlands, and you think that it then found its way up into the mountains and became the highland white eye or the Ceylon white eye or Sri Lanka white eye, depending on what you want to call it. Another theory is that from the same species in India, one came and occupied the lowlands, and then another group from the same population came and occupied mountains because the physical habitats are different over a period of time because of physical pressures and natural selection. They, they continued as two different species, and, and, and the Ceylon white type then became this mountain endemic. But the surprising result is that that's not what has happened. So the oriental white type came from India, and it remains as the oriental white type, and it shared with India. The Ceylon white type came from somewhere else, we don't know where, occupied mountains, and over time evolved into a different endemic species. So it's very different to what we had thought may have happened. And it's interesting how genetics is sort of showing, uh, can give us a window into the past. It's almost like a 
traveling millions of years back in time and we're piecing together what happened. White toes are a very uh, interesting species. They're, they're what's called a super speciator. And if we get some of the numbers I have put there, I said that just this, uh, there are 135 species of white tides. So they are very well known that population flies into a bunch of islands and then speciates into different species. 